Hello, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Royal Photographic Society and this latest in series of talks looking at specialist photographic collections and archives. It's my pleasure to introduce our host for this evening, Gilly Reid, Chair of the RPS's Historical Group. Gilly, over to you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. And it's nice to be doing a web talk again after some time. And tonight we have with us Jamie Carstairs uh, from the University of Bristol talking about the, his, the historical collection of Chinese photographs in Bristol University. Jamie Carstairs is the Senior Digitization Officer for the Library Services in Bristol. And he looks after the historical photographs of China physical collections and digital images now held in special collections, University of Bristol. The collections are listed on special collections online archive. Um, and he is going to give us this talk this evening. So uh, how, how did this collection come about? I'm not going to spend long, but how long did it come about? How did it come about, Jamie? Did people come from working in China and bring back albums with them to the UK. Yes, I thought it might be that. Yes, a lot of it's um, collections owned by families uh, from their predecessors who worked or lived in China. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I thought it might be that. Oh, well, anyway, so I think we're about due to start. So I better say over to Jamie now. Great, thank you. Well, thank you, Gilly, for that uh, introduction. Um, so the Historical Photographs of China project was set up in the History Department at the University of Bristol by Professor Robert Vickers in 2006 uh, with the staff of one, which was me. Um, the project was always a shoestring operation, uh, sometimes uh, two shoestrings, it was supposed to be a six month project, but it uh, actually ran for 15 years. So what do we do? Well, we've located old photographs of China, um, as, as said, often owned by families, borrowed them, uh, digitized them. Um, families would give us permission to put them online or low res versions of the images online. Um, and then we put the images up on our website with um, associated metadata and keywords so people could find them. As I said, most of the collections were uh, owned by families. Um, uh, some were in archives and museums already. And um, I digitized, I borrowed those collections and digitized them here. And I also did some on location digitization in um, families um, or in museums. Our main aim was to populate the historical photographs of China website. Um, there's the front, uh, the home page. Um, it's um, a fully searchable um, website um, organized by collections. So uh, here, here are the, the first page of collections. Uh, we have brief biographies of photographers um, and other, other features. Lucky Dip is quite good fun if, if you, if you um, don't quite know what you want to look at, but you just want to waste some time if you like. Um, in fact, the website has been described as dangerous uh, due to the multiple rabbit holes uh, therein and um, just getting lost in, in, in old China. Recently, all our digital images were transferred to a digital asset management system, Preservica, and the website has been rebuilt on a Django platform. This is actually our fourth iteration of a website. Um, the project ended just over two years ago. Um, all its assets, uh, including myself, were transferred from the history department to special collections in the University of Bristol's library. Um, we no longer do the borrowing and copying uh, that we did, um, but 
special collections uh, can still uh, consider a, a donation of suitable material. So why do we do this? Well, old photographs of China have a particular historical value um, because of all the wars, revolutions, 20th century turmoil in, in China um, has resulted in destruction of the built environment and of course, recent um, modernization as well. Um, as well as the old buildings and so on going, um, ways of life have gone, archives have gone, museums have gone. And in some cases, uh, the photographs themselves were destroyed. Uh, for example, in the 1966 Cultural Revolution, people would destroy their photographs. Um, so the old photographs have this value uh, in themselves. They're also very informative historical documents if, if you read them critically uh, and if the accompanying information about uh, the, the photographs is correct. So one of our aims uh, was restitution of this uh, lost heritage to China. It's lot of pictures of its old ways of life, everyday life, um, people, buildings, so on, history, all the history. And one one um, aspect of the restitution is that we have a mirror site, uh, a mirror of the Bristol site hosted in uh, a university in Shanghai, which has a lot of the um, information in Chinese. So how did we do it? Well, um, the material comes in in, in um, all different um, forms. Um, there's neg albums of negatives here, uh, it's albums of photographs, loose photographs. Um, we also digitize lantern slides, 35 millimeter color slides, uh, and postcards, especially uh, real photo postcards. So we've always used the camera on copy stand method uh, rather than a flatbed scanner. So this is the one in the history department, and this is the one I use now in, in the library at University of Bristol. We don't use a flatbed scanner because albums, etc., often can't be opened um, flat. So you can, they're difficult to use a flatbed scanner, whereas you can prop them up with sponges or something, and you don't have to crack them open absolutely flat. We photograph every page of every album to capture the captioning and uh, the layout. This is a Charles Darwin uh, album. And then we photograph every individual photograph as well. Um, so this one gets the reference DA0115, Chinese New Year's Day um, in Shanghai. Um, everyone wearing their best holiday clothes, um, shops are shut, and there's little New Year messages stuffed into the, uh, into the shutters. All the um, captioning that's in the album or uh, written on the back of the photographs or on the front is uh, recorded uh, against the image reference number. And then we also put other metadata and information onto a spreadsheet. Uh, this, this information is then transferred into the digital asset management system. Um, this can be done in an automatic way, um, and um, it, it can also be done um, sort of manually, copy and paste. From the digital asset management system, the metadata uh, is um, published on our website uh, here. Um, and the website also draws the actual image from the digital asset management system um, on the on the on the dams. It's a high res TIFF appears on the website as a low res JPEG, um, which uh, you can download and use uh, 
under a Creative Commons license, um, which basically is uh, you, you, you include the provenance of uh, the photograph when you use it. If you wanted to use a high res picture in a book or um, exhibition, uh, you can contact us and uh, we can usually uh, obtain permission from the owner and supply the high res um, image. So what did we achieve uh, during the 15 years the project was running? Um, well, lots of figures, uh, 66,000 uh, photographs were copied um, and are now on the, in the digital asset management system. Of those, uh, 23,000 are published uh, on the website. Uh, so I would dearly love to um, publish some of the other um, 43,000 that have been digitized. Uh, some of them are really good images. It'd be really nice to see them published. Uh, so about 170 collections. Um, we didn't mean to collect physical uh, albums and actual photographs. Um, we always were borrowing. Um, but when people said, oh, I'm about to throw it in the bin, do you want it? We would tend to say yes. So we've ended up with um, quite a good uh, physical collection of actual uh, photographs in, in the archives here. 125,000 uh, different people visited the website in uh, 2021. The Chinese mirror site also has a lot of visitors. Um, very, very popular in China. They have um, something they call Lao Xiao Pian, which is old photos fever. Very interested in the history and in the old photographs. Another impact was uh, an, an exhibition we had at the Brunei Gallery at SOAS University of London in 2007. Uh, 112 framed prints, um, a book, here's the cover, um, screenings, the screening here, uh, Warren Swire photographs traveling down the, the Yangtze display cabinets, talks, uh, we had a royal visit, and we also had um, a small section of old China hands. So people who were connected to our collections one way or another, who had a, a history of being in, living in China. Here's Johnny Fu, the, the son of Fu Bing Chang, the photographer, holding the old China hands were holding an item of significance to them. Um, in this case, um, a framed uh, calligraphy. But another exhibition um, based on a guidebook by the Reverend Charles Darwin. Um, so Charles Darwin uh, uh, was the Reverend of the Union Church in Shanghai. He was also um, the founder of the Shanghai Amateur Photographic Society. A very keen photographer, as they say. Um, this guidebook, uh, he, he would say, oh, the photographer would be remiss to, to not go to this district. And the photographer must see this activity. And this corner is a very good spot for Chinese characteristic Chinese activities. Um, so um, here's an example of his um, comments in his guidebook. Good photographs may be had all along, for there can be no questioning the picturesqueness of the Chinese chop, shop front. So this is uh, he's talking about Nanjing Road. Um, so based on um, Darwin's comments in his guidebook, I went to Shanghai and took a photograph, for example, the one on the right here, of uh, a picturesque uh, Chinese shop front, uh, which involved um, turtles, I think they are, um, swimming around as the shop front. Um, 
coincidentally, we were given an album of Darwin's own photographs, and that's one of his on the left there, also uh, Nanjing Road. The Darwin exhibition was uh, a pop-up exhibition. Um, Here it is, uh, with the sort of relationship shots going on with hats. So you've got Darwin's photograph, person in a hat, my photograph, person in a hat, and then someone looking at it. Um, what else? Well, um, our HPC images have been published in a lot of books, in journals, used in exhibitions, on television, college lectures, school projects, social media, blogs. Etc. And um, these three books published by Blacksmith Books with uh, co nice covers from our pictures, our pictures, I say. <laughs> um, Bing Chang, um, very good photographer in the pictorialist uh, tradition, actually a very good portrait photographer. Um, he was also a uh, very senior um, in the in the in the um, Nationalist Party. Uh, ended up as uh, the ambassador in Moscow during World War II. So I, I think through his pictures being on our website, he gained wider recognition, uh, so much so that he made it to the 1001 photographs you must see before you die. Radio 4 um, did a very nice um, documentary about us and um, you can still sit, listen to this. If you go to our website, there's a link to it. Um, Professor Bicker's website crashed after this was broadcast with so many people sending in pictures that they thought uh, he would like to see. The AHRC did a, a little film about us. And uh, at this point, I should thank all the funders, uh, as well as the Arts and Humanities Research Council. We were funded by um, Worldwide Universities Network, John Swire and Sons, and the British Academy as well, the only photography um, project they've ever uh, supported. We have a um, blog site, um, which, Anyone who has anything interesting about uh, wants to write about but, um, can can send in a proposal. Um, during COVID times, it was very useful to for um, books, people publishing books, and very difficult to promote them during during those days. Uh, we also have a Twitter account, which is quite lively and an Instagram, Facebook, and so on. And in China, we have a Weibo account, similar to Twitter, which has thousands and thousands of followers. Along the way, we got into the grave restoration business. Um, so this is the grave of Sir Robert Hart and Lady Hart, um, which was in a very bad way. And uh, Wei Bin Tsai on the right um, had the brilliant idea to restore it. Um, and that's Professor Vickers there. So we we restored it. Um, we also um, got into restoring John Thompson's grave with the John Thompson uh, Commemoration Committee, um, including Michael Pritchard. So on the left, as it was photographed by Terry Bennett, and on the right after it, the grave stone had been restored. John Thompson also was uh, nominated for a plaque on his childhood home here in Edinburgh. And uh, I should say it's um, today is uh, the day that he was born in 19, 1837. What else did we achieve? Well, in the in terms of the history of photography of China, probably the most interesting is, is this very significant discovery of Charles Frederick Moore, who's kind of the last unknown major photographer in China, who um, was found by um, someone sending me um, a, a link to, to a, a diary entry and then searching for him and finding that his negatives, as the one on the right here, um, 
are in the museum in Canada. And then looking through them, oh, we've got uh, that a print from that negative in one of our collections on the left there, um, which uh, was quite a surprise and looked into it more and have actually worked out now that um, we've got several pictures uh, by Moore and I, I've identified about 400 of those pictures now so far. So quite a sort of significant bit of the sky, if you like, a difficult part of uh, attributions of 19th century photographers in China. Here's one of um, Moore's photographs. His prints often have an ornate rounded corner at the top. Uh, so if you see that, there's a good chance um, it's a photograph by him. Um, so this is one of the um, European style palace buildings, uh, the old summer palace, um, plundered and burnt down by the British and the French in, in, in 1860. And this building was the only large building um, that survived with its roof intact. Other um, photo detective, if you like, discoveries along the way, um, often just luck, serendipity. So the photograph on the left came to us in an album with no caption. Um, you could see it's something to do with the cutting of the cue or uh, um, you know, the pigtail or whatever um, that uh, all Chinese men uh, that was how they did their hair until the 1911 revolution. So we we think it's something to do with perhaps a theatrical event um, to do with uh, that opera type person dressed on the left and a soldier having a beer poured for him. Um, anyway, years later, the photograph on the right came up for sale on eBay. And of course, um, as you can see, the the backdrop is the same. So now we knew um, who took the photograph on the left, um, which is uh, quite quite nice to know that sort of thing. Um, another one, um, the page on the left um, is in an album recently donated. Um, I didn't know who the photographer was, no idea. And then um, happen to see this tweet on the right. Uh, so our album has the little stuck in labels in English and the, the one on the right is in Japanese. So in correspondence with Lu Zhu um, and another older tweet worked out that the photographer is Ichiro Sakurai. Uh, I think a very gifted photographer, not, not particularly well known. In, in the West anyway, probably quite well known in, in Japan. This is another example of sort of accidentally finding out stuff. So the photograph came to us in an album, again, no caption in the album, don't know anything about it. Um, I could see it was an otter, I could see that um, they were fishing boats, but that was about it. Uh, then one day I was reading La from Diplomat by Daniel Barre, who was um, an Italian uh, diplomat in China. And uh, th there he is uh, saying, um, a Buddhist priest lives in a little hollow between the two conical hills. Whoops. And he asks for arms for passers by on the water by holding out a long bang bamboo with a bag attached to the end. And so on. So there, there, there it is, conical hills. We can see them in the background. We can see the bamboo poles. And now we know what's going on. So that was quite interesting. Now we now have a location and an understanding of what was actually happening in this, this photograph. This uh, triptych uh, also puzzled me. It's in another collection digitized uh, not long ago. Um, what is going on? Uh, it, it sort of almost looks like sinking into um, sort of quicksand. Uh, anyway, it was a puzzle until uh, until I remembered and came across again this photograph. 
Um, Eve Arnold. Basically, horse training. So it's um, the, the, the Lionel Howell and his wonderful horse. It's uh, a Mongolian horse trained to fly down. On a, on a sort of very incidental uh, sort of serendipity, the photograph on the left, um, we, we actually built, bought that one on eBay. So for the, um, for the political banners. Um, and then one day I was looking in a Magnum book about China photographs and I was rather surprised to realize, ah, now we know where Robert Kappa was when he took his photograph and his photograph on the right. Uh, so he's sitting just inside the um, headquarters of the Session des étudiants chinois de la Tour. Um, so that, that was just a, almost not 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 important, but just nice nice sort of thing to find out along the way. So how do we get reliable metadata? Uh, which is really the, the, one of the main points of what we, we've been trying to do. Um, most of this will be fairly obvious to, to any photo researcher. Um, so Terry Bennett's books, absolutely fantastic. Other books of China, photographs, books about China, including novels, diaries, letters, memoirs, travelogues, all useful. Also just for the words that are used to describe things in China, in the 18th and 19th century, words that uh, I, one may not know necessarily, but if you have the words, then um, you can describe things properly. Maps, important, of course, old maps, new maps. Visual intelligence, being able to read images, looking at them closely. Memory, remembering problem images, unidentified locations, so that, uh, as in the earlier examples, years later you come across something, you say, ah, oh, yes, that's that, right, now I understand. Um, knowledge of photographic processes helps, history of China helps, topography, so you know some areas of China are flat, some are mountainous, If you, that obviously can help um, locate places, just general human behaviour, you know, agendas of the photographer or publisher, those things are useful. Um, images in China collections we've already digitised, that's useful. Um, I think being older, being an, uh, a bridge between analog and digital photography, knowing both uh, ways of ways of doing it is is helpful. Being skeptical about all captioning in everywhere, in museums, in books, everywhere. They don't don't take anything uh, as gospel. Um, a postcard's probably the worst, uh, and always seeking corroboration. It once you think you've got the answer to something, knowing who to ask if you're really stumped. And of course, people getting in touch with us and correcting our mistakes, very welcome. Um, some online ways of checking um, captioning, which is always location dates, who, where, when. Um, Googling, obviously, Google Images, Google Lens, reverse image engine, very useful. DL translator, I don't actually speak Chinese, so that's been very useful. Um, online uh, newspapers, Ancestry, um, online archives like Virtual Shanghai, there's also a list of useful links to other online archives on visualizingchina.net, our blog site. Searching on eBay, strangely, is quite useful uh, because so much stuff comes up for sale there. Uh, if you select completed items, you get even more um, things to, 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 to just, just, just to see. You never know. So how do things, uh, how do we get uh, images? Well, it often starts with an email. Someone sends us an email. Um, this collection turned out to be compiled by a University of Bristol graduate who went out to China after she graduated, became a teacher, married a stockbroker. Here's the collection brought back from Canada recently. 
It's a silk panorama of Shanghai, which I'm pretty sure is copied from a photograph. And a lovely book of Donald Manny's photographs, postcards, albums. So we accession material, sort it, box it, put it in archival conditions here. The green boxes are the China photo collections in our archives here. Um, catalog the material. So here's our online archive catalog homepage. If you um, go to advanced search just above the main search box there and click on advanced search and then click on major collections and then click on China and in brackets historical photographs of China, you will get all the uh, China material that's been donated to us over the years or, or acquired. Here's a typical catalog entry. This one for the Hummel family collection we're just talking about. One of my favorite photos from this collection, um, a very smiley cormorant fisherman. Um, so they would fish with cormorants with a ring around their necks. So the cormorants didn't swallow the fish. Uh, every now and then, the fisherman would take the ring off and the, fish, the, the cormorant could actually eat something, but most of the time it's just collecting fish for the fisherman. It's another photograph in this collection. Um, so this is um, a Chinese goddess. On the back, Hartung's Photoshop. Legation Street, Peking. So this was nice because this is where Hedda Hammer worked. Uh, the wonderful German photographer, better known by a married name, Hedda Morrison. So this might actually be one of her photos, but anyway, it's been sold in the shop probably. Uh, this is a, a, a very nice uh, double exposure from this collection, possibly a deliberate double exposure or, or done in, in a uh, dark room printing, not sure. So other recent uh, developments. So new to our website is the Hutchinson family collection. Um, 1,100, sorry, 1,666 images, um, which was digitized quite a while ago. Um, project assistant has worked with the family that owns the collection very closely and we were able to get the uh, the whole collection published in one go recently. Uh, the photographs focus on the Hutchinson family and friends and richly illustrate the life of the Eurasian community in Hong Kong and Shanghai. So on the right is um, what you see if you click on one of the uh, images. That's the image entry. If you click on the image again, it gets a bit bigger. So here's some more Hutchinson images. Hong Kong on the left, Shanghai on the right. On the far right is a Chinese post box. And the woman on the left, Lucy Hutchinson, is holding a handbag, which has caused a bit of a stir on Twitter. Everyone wants one now. Another favorite photograph from the Hutchinson collection. This is during some troubles in Shanghai, 1925. We've now extended our date range for collecting images. Uh, the, the, the Historical Photographs of China project website finished in the 1950s, but we, we now are collecting more recent material. Um, for example, this, this collection, uh, Colin Andrew, um, color slides from 1966, not yet online. Um, nice to 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 um, disseminate them at some stage 
Another new development here is the Hong Kong History Center, which is just getting going. It's going to have um, some PhD students and a Bristol Hong Kong archive for physical things, and also a historical photographs of Hong Kong website and archivists working here as well. So if you were to search on the Historical Photographs of China website for photography, you get 272 results. Of course, you can search for anything, whatever interests you, but uh, um, I've collected here up for some um, sort of images of photographic um, interest. Uh, it's a bit random. Um, but uh, here we go. So unusual print format on the left, very economical. It's a very small print, that one. Um, and on the right, um, there's some really interesting uh, darkroom work there um, for the uh, Erdogan II portrait. Um, this is a, quite an old picture now, 1907, about uh, seven boys in a photographer's studio looking at photograph albums. Uh, so we have to admire the photographer for gaining nearly the attention of nearly all of them. Uh, this is a very nice studio prop, a motorbike, um, or really just the, the handles of a motorbike. Um, this, this uh, style of portraiture very popular in China and really took off in the 1940s and 50s and 60s. Um, absolutely wonderful um, studio props. Here's a um, photographer's darkroom right up on the roof in, uh, in Guangzhou, Canton. With, I think, uh, the studio part of it is the glazed bit you can see, and then a bit to the right you can see some louved windows. I, I'm guessing that's the actual darkroom painted. It's just by a canal, hence the sampans in the foreground. I like this picture too because um, it shows a tea tasting room. Um, which also, like photographer studios, would face north uh, so that the light was uh, even on, on the tea leaves for, for, for checking the um, colour. Uh, and here they're also tasting the tea to check the flavour. More photography interest, a darkroom, a floating darkroom. Um, uh, a dark tent, really. Um, this is Lai Fong, who was the, almost without doubt, the, the best of the 19th century Chinese photographers, um, which we have in, a, in, the, in the John Gurney Fry collection, very nice. Um, the collection also contains um, John Thompson's, some, some John Thompson photos, which is nice too, because he's the best of the foreign 19th century photographers in China. So you'd have to develop your um, negative straight away uh, and under this process, hence uh, uh, having to have sort of cart around a dark room with you. Uh, this is um, up, up on the Great Wall of China, a, um, a hand colored Photograph. I at one time I thought it was early color photography, but it's it's not. In fact, it's it's hand colored. It's uh, some uh, montage, photo montage. Um, the picture on the left, uh, with two people in the foreground have been cut out and stuck on, uh, partly obscuring the the man holding the camel. All the children are having a party in, indoors when Father Christmas arrives on a camel. This photo was published in the Times in, in, 
in February of 1924. Um, the picture on the right, again, some quite uh, interesting photo montage. I think a publicity shot on the left, not sure. We just have it, don't know anything about it more than itself. Photograph on the right, we do know a bit more. Thomas Krellin, uh, the man on the left, he uh, he was a photographer and cinema photographer, um, worked in South Africa and in China and back in England. And for, for a while, he ran, ran the Kodak Professional School, um, teaching people to process um, negatives and make prints. So here we have a photograph by Malcolm Rochel, who was a, a, a journalist and photojournalist um, in Shanghai, Ninth Settlement. We digitized all his negatives. Um, and this one, you can see he's uh, cropped it in, in white um, for publication. Uh, it amuses me the, the number 122. Uh, I don't know if that's, he got, unfortunately, the, the last bit of film in some bulk film or whether it was the lab that <laughs> um, stamped that onto his uh, negative and rather sort of spoiled in some ways uh, but, I, it, it, it's, but I, you know, I think it adds to it. So the uh, notice that the Chinese nationalist soldiers had the uh, German um, made helmets So Martin Funnell um, was a British national serviceman posted to Hong Kong. And um, as Corporal Funnell as he was then, he made a, a panoramic camera out of uh, cardboard glued with secotine, that's refined fish glue, balsa cement, brown sticky paper, a motor from an alarm clock, and a recycled medium format camera lens. They so would take these quite wonderful panoramic photos. This one um, with a, a, a sort of exaggerated curvature of the earth, which is just a, 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 a mistake, if you like, of uh, the, the process of his uh, panoramic camera as the alarm clock mechanism wound the lens around um, to take in 141 degrees. Um, the camera we now have in the archive here on the right, on the bottom right, it's not the actual camera who took this photo with. That camera, the one made of balsa wood, it didn't survive the journey back. And so he made another one in the 1950s uh, about metal, and that's the one on the right. And we have quite a lot of his uh, negatives um, uh, and um, color transparencies of um, the panoramic photos he took uh, here in the archive are uh, very nice. Here's a, a famous photojournalist, uh, Harrison Foreman, using an IMO uh, movie uh, camera. Um, another photograph by Malcolm Rocholt. Rocholt was quite jealous of Foreman, um, but uh, um, Foreman did did actually teach Rochelle how to use his light meter. This must be one of the uh, first uh, selfies in China, um, about 1931. Jack F. Gray, very nice collection. Young lad, took a lot of photographs in the turmoil of 1932 in, in Shanghai, very interesting collection. This picture, is, I'm fairly sure it's a, it's it's just a scene from the filming, or perhaps it's a publicity shot about the filming. Uh, the film was called "The King of Comedy Visits Shanghai," and there he is, Charlie Chaplin, um, Richard Bell impersonated Charlie Chaplin, and in this scene, he's he's acting him, I expect, talking or shaking hands with an opera singer. 
Um, the interesting thing about this reenacted studio tableau, tableau, I think, is that in 1936, so 14 years later or so, uh, Charlie Chaplin did actually visit Shanghai. Uh, the King of Comedy did visit Shanghai and he attended a banquet hosted by the studio that made this film. So that was um, life imitating art, if you like. So here we have um, on the left, a very nice caricature by Miguel Covarrubias of Sir Victor Sassoon. Uh, it was incredibly wealthy, um, businessman in Shanghai. Um, so there he is with a, a Leica and some lighting, and he's on holiday in Bali. Um, there's currently an exhibition all about the Sassoons in New York. Very interesting family indeed. Um, the man on the right um, is, <laughs> well, he's dressed in fancy dress as a Chinese photographer with a shutter release um, squeezy thing, collecting money for the Ryder Carnival. So I thought we should have uh, some mention of light, um, which of course is our photographer's basic ingredient. Uh, there's a very beautiful photograph here. Um, about 1920 or so. Italians call this effetto di Dio, um, which doesn't sound so good in English as God effect. Some more light. Uh, Arthur Fiddleman traveled around the world in 1945. Um, he was an air marshal, air vice marshal, and he was checking out airfields around the world in anticipation of a complete change of direction. So rather than fighting Germans and Japanese, uh, thinking about uh, fighting um, the USSR. So uh, he visited lots of airfields, but whilst he was doing that, he just took general photographs uh, and he had managed to get hold of some Kodachrome uh, color slide film and uh, the, um, this rather beautiful afterglow. So this is a, a detail of the photograph shown right at the beginning. Um, if anyone knows what these items are, uh, something, uh, some kind of kaleidoscope, perhaps, I don't know. Um, yeah, let us know if you know what they are. Little boy with a cue and shaved forehead there. So we know this photograph is before 1911 for sure. Um, and here, sort of ending up, um, all of us as photographers um, and people involved with visual things, here is the shrine of the eye god um, with lots of uh, spectacles, etc. If you go to London um, to see China's hidden century, at the British Museum until the 8th of October. Um, look out for, for this picture. It is, I'm told, uh, somewhere in the exhibition. So you win a Mars bar if you find it. So there are um, our two websites, um, the blog site below. So that's, that's the end of my presentation. That was fantastic, Jamie. Thank you so much for, for sharing your knowledge and, and giving us that insight into the Historical Photographs of China collection. It, it really is interesting. So if anyone has any questions and would like to drop them into the chat, that they'd be very welcome. Um, there's a couple of questions that have come up, come to me in the meantime, which I'll, I'll start off with. Um, and the first one's really just asking about the future of the collection and whether there's any likely to be any opportunity to continue to grow it and to make those other thousands of photographs that are digitized available. Mm, very good question. Um, I, for speaking for myself, I really hope uh, uh, 
a way can be found to to um, essentially to fund the work uh, uh, to get uh, um, the, the you know twenty odd thousand pictures of which you know maybe only five thousand or so would be worth uh, doing. But uh, I would very much be in favour of um, a, a project or something or other uh, to get them onto our website. It, it's quite time consuming um, adding. Uh, metadata to images. Um, um, I, I briefly touched on how we uh, research and try to find out who, what, where, when, why. Um, but one doesn't want to spend a lot of time doing that. Uh, uh, it, usually one gives up quite quickly. If you don't get an answer quite quickly, you just put it into your pile of problem, the mental pile of problem images. Um, so, um, unfortunately it just takes a lot, of, it takes time to, to get a uh, good information, reliable information about a photo up on the website. Um, all the images are in our digital asset management system. So it is now a case of, uh, just adding, um, the metadata and the keywords so you can find the image on online and so on. Um, so. I don't know the the question about whether um, we can add more uh, uh, is not really it's 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 not my my uh, sort of call. Uh, I, as I said, I I would support it if if uh, it could be done. Um, in the meantime, the, the the digital images are safe and secure. They're they're properly backed up. Um, so they're there sort of ready to be exploited, if you like, or used or, or disseminated. Um, and the physical material that we've been given over the years is also uh, kept here in good archival conditions and, and could, could be digitized. So there's quite a lot of it's not even being digitized. Um, so uh, that's that would be something else too. And the second question before I come to our Zoom question, is around, and you sort of touched on this in your presentation, but um, um, the, the question is just wondering uh, how our researchers have used the site and whether there are any, any particularly exciting discoveries that have been made within the collection. Um, the ways people have used it are absolutely endless. Uh, it's extraordinary. Um, uh, I think one, one area where we were quite helpful was in bridge rush, a bridge being restored in uh, near Shanghai, and that they were very interested in our pictures of that. Um, but um, what else? Gosh, uh, loads of uh, books. Um, I'm not sure what's. I'm not sure how much has been discovered by the people using the images, but. Um, Certainly, other people have um, uh, found stuff it, uh, and and discovered things. Um, there, there's there's a book of photography written recently. Um, lots of insights up, up into the material. Um, yeah, it's it lots of uses. So really, I I I wouldn't know where to begin. <laughs> I think 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 you've um, shown us um, lots of examples in any case. So um, I'll come to our Zoom questions. We've got a couple coming in at the moment. So Philip's firstly thanking you for the presentation, then asking for older photos that are digitally restored. Did you use any general digital standards, sepia, black and white contrast, etc., or did you work on each photograph on an ad hoc basis to emphasise details and or artistic aspect? And I should probably just jump in here and say, you know, how much digital restoration do you do before you make the, the images live? Right. Very good question again. Um, generally, uh, no particular uh, spotting, cleaning up of images uh, other than um, uh, if, it, if the original was very faded, um, one would sort of bring back uh, the uh, histogram so that um, you could actually see what was in the print. Um, so this is probably not what most archives do. They just digitize and say, here it is, this is an object. It's a faded 
photograph, you can hardly see anything. That's what we've got. <laughs> so we didn't do that. We would try to uh, actually bring back the contrast and brightness um, uh, so you could see what was going on in, in the photo. Uh, so the ones, the photographs that appear on the website are not uh, manipulated. Uh, they, 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 they're not being uh, tidied up, if you like. Um, however, when, um, when we put on exhibitions, we would uh, do some spotting, which is basically in, 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 you know, all the little blemishes you see on a um, print and dots and so on. Um, they can be quite distracting. So you, could, you can clean them up and, uh, in Photoshop. Um, and we would do that for exhibitions and sometimes for um, images that are going to be used in books or something. Uh, but as a general rule, it, we, it, we just wouldn't have had time to, to do a lot of cleaning up and making things look nicer um, and certainly not adding sepia. In fact, so quite often if, if, if you've got a sepia photo original and it's faded, so when you bring the, you sort of sort out the, um, the levels, uh, uh, you, you find the whole thing goes very orange and, and like completely unrealistic. So you might then just tone down that um, the, with the desaturation. Um, so you are kind of, you're, you're not saying this is a facsimile. This, you, we weren't saying this is a, this is a, a it, this is, it's been manipulated in the sense that what the information that's latent in the image is brought out so you can see it. Because really, I, to my mind, there's no point in saying, oh, this is a faded photograph and we don't know what it's in it. <laughs> Not much point in that, I think, anyway. Mm. Um, and then there's a comment from Barbara, which is interesting. Uh, firstly, again, thanking you for the presentation and for showing some of the Hutchinson photos uh, and then saying you probably know that one of Fred and Lucy in Hong Kong has gone a bit viral, having been colorized by someone in Hong Kong, she thinks. Oh, yes, yes. Well, the, the, the afterlife of images once they get online, especially on Twitter, is is pretty extraordinary. And um, um, and yeah, people um, people love to to colorize them, um, uh, which I, I'm I'm a bit ambiguous. But it's, uh, part part of me thinks, oh, that's that's lovely, and you can sometimes the colors bring out parts of a photo that you hadn't really uh, thought about or been you know considered or thought what they were or so on. Um, but also, of course, the colors are uh, just put in. Uh, by uh, an algorithm, I suppose, ultimately, or, or, or to a certain extent chosen by the person doing the coloring. Uh, and of course, they're not necessarily the colors that were on the original. So uh, that, that's where I'm in two minds. On, on the whole, I think it's it's fairly harmless and um, uh, and it, it's quite a, an interesting way of um, making black and white photos more, um, I don't know, more palatable or more relevant to, to nowadays. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like the handbag you mentioned also is another one of those that maybe touched a, a nerve with contemporary audiences as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and Thomas is asking, firstly, thanking you for the introduction to the collection, then asking whether you have any daguerreotypes in the collection. Oh, I wish. Um, <laughs> but the um, daguerreotypes uh, of taken in China are extremely rare. Uh, the, the process is pretty difficult and it, it kind of got superseded before it could really get a foothold in China. Um, there, there are some that uh, taken uh, uh, Etier, I think his name was, French photographer um, in Macau, took some uh, daguerreotypes. Um, they're, um, they're rare as hen's teeth and uh, uh, no, no one's found any in their attics and alerted us to them. So um, no, no <laughs> need to need to check Terry's book and uh, some of some of the other references on on that to see some reproductions, which I'm sure Anne's aware of. In any case, so um, I think that's our last question. So. Firstly, um, just falls to me to for firstly to thank you, Jamie, for 
sharing those insights and for, for answering the questions so um, generously as well. And, and thank you for that. I think you'll see a spike in your web traffic after the, the presentation now, which I hope um, maybe will lead on to some new acquisitions. And secondly, I'd like to thank Gilly for introducing you this evening and for, for helping arrange this evening's talk. We've got further talks in this series scheduled um, I think, uh, Gilly, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the next one is the looking at the Faye Godwin collection at the British Library, which I think would be really interesting also because it's um, um, Faye Godwin is a name that would be familiar to, I'm sure, many of you. And her archive at the British Library is, is probably less well known than, than even Jamie's collection. So do join us for that. Um, details for booking, which is free, is on the, the RPS website and look out for further um uh, talks in this series uh, throughout the year. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Gilly. Thanks, Jamie. And thanks to our audience for staying with us this evening. Good night, everyone. Good night. And thank you very much, Jamie, from me. Great. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you.